I'm Dave Zirin, and I love sports. And I basically made a career out of trying to understand that murky place where sports and politics collide. As a writer... To discuss athletes and activism, we now welcome Dave Zirin, author and sports editor of The Nation magazine. As a commentator on ESPN and other major networks, and in my sports radio show. Yo, we got a hell of a show this week. Yo, we're talking, this is where sports and politics collide. And one of the first things I discovered was that sports is political in ways we don't often even notice, especially on the level of culture, where our ideas and attitudes as a society are shaped. This is rough, hard football. We got a bunch of proud, valiant warriors. Fight! That's all I've asked you to do, is fight for me with everything you work. The world of sports has traditionally been thought of as a male arena. Masculine, pumped up, comfortable with violence, immune to pain, and against showing vulnerability of any kind. It's war. They don't give a freaking, you know what, about you. They will kill you. They're out there to kill you. If I didn't hurt him, he'd hurt me. They're gunning for my legs. I'm gonna come right back at him. Soldier. I went to a baseball game a few years back, and it turned out I was also attending something called Military Appreciation Night. Before the opening pitch, with George W. Bush in attendance, a whole group of Marines were sworn in at home plate. Then the PA announcer came in and said, For those of you in the audience who also want a career in the military, please visit the appropriate kiosk. If going to war isn't political, then nothing is. And yet this mix of sports and politics seems perfectly natural to us. We're made to think it's not political at all, that it's just the way it is. But there's just one problem with this whole notion that sports is somehow pure and should remain untouched by the world outside. It misses how the supposed purity of sports has long since been defiled by commercialism. Gatorade, that's G. More than anything else, I'd argue that it is corporate power and fear of a backlash from sponsors that drives the anti-political attitude we find in our sports culture and makes athletes afraid to rock the boat. Some social observers say it was Michael Jordan who set the example for star athletes on being apolitical. In 1990, he famously declined to back a Democratic African-American Senate candidate in his home state of North Carolina by responding, Republicans buy sneakers too. Some cave, some stand up for what they believe regardless of the consequences. When one man of popularity can let the world know the problem, he, can, uh, he might lose a few dollars himself telling the truth, might lose his life, but he's helping millions. So I just love the freedom and the flesh and blood of my people more so than I do the money. You can take it sure and play it right in Washington, let Nixon hear it. And some, like LeBron James, can't seem to make up their minds. LeBron James and others concerned about their legacies would do well to remember the side of history Ali was on. They would do well to remember how today's play it safe commercial mindset conceals a long-standing countercurrent that's been there throughout the history of sports. Embodied in athletes like Billie Jean King. Bobby Riggs plays Mrs. Billie Jean King on a tennis court in Houston tonight. It's a match that's being billed as an epic battle of the sexes. In front of a sold-out crowd at the Houston Astrodome, she beat the retired tennis star Bobby Riggs in straight sets in what remains one of the most watched television programs in the history of sports, Jackie Robinson. As a black man, I find it quite discouraging to look around and find how little has been done to lift minorities from the depths of poverty and despair. Tommy Smith and John Carlos, who turned American sports culture on its head in the late 1960s. Do you think the Olympic Games are the right place to do this kind of thing? That you ought to use this as a kind of world stage? David, since we are athletes, although I am a teacher, but I'm not a politician, uh, we use this so the whole world could see the poverty of the black man in America. At the same time, cynics might say that you've got it all. You've got publicity, you've got medals, you've all you've got martyrdom as well. What are you going to say to that? I can't eat that. And the kids around my block, they grew up with me. They can't eat it. And the kids that's going to grow up after them, they can't eat publicity. They can't eat gold medals, as Tommy Smith said. 
All we ask for is equal chance to be a human being. And as far as I see now, we're five steps below the ladder. And every time we try and touch the ladder, they put their foot on our hands and don't want us to climb up. Moments like these are a crucial part of the history of American sports, part of a long legacy of struggle and courage in the face of injustice that has largely been forgotten as politics has come to be considered not only inappropriate in the arena of sports, but actually antithetical to it. We want so much to see sports solely as an arena of play, not seriousness. But here's the thing. This can cheapen not only the greatness and relevance of sports to us as a society, but also the courage of athletes. And we do an injustice to them and to what's best about sports when we sanitize the past and rip athletics out of the political and cultural context it has always been a part of. Keeping our mouths shut in the face of injustice may help us make fun of others and silence them and assure that we stay popular with the keepers of normality but real courage means standing up when it's not popular. And real men and real women don't ask permission to raise their fists. <laughs>